Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Room 42. I'm Liz Fraley from Single Sourcing Solutions. I'm your moderator. This is Janice Summers, our interviewer, and welcome to Tim Amadon, today's guest in Room 42. Dr. Tim Amadon is an Associate Professor of Digital Rhetoric at Colorado State University. He holds appointments within the English Department and the Colorado School of Public Health. His research surrounds the interrelationships between technology, agency, workplace literacy, and he's focused on interest on rhetorics of data, risk communication, intellectual property, occupational safety, and health. He's been published in journals like Communication Design Quarterly, the Journal of Business and Technical Communication, Kairos, and has presented at conferences like the International Design, and I love the way this is, International Conference on Design, Usability, and Usability, and ACM SIGDOG. He has also served as a firefighter, EMT, technical rescuer, fire instructor, and fire officer in fire and emergency services organizations for over 20 years. It's fascinating. And today he's here to help us start answering the question, how might digital technologies displace existing tools, practices, and literacies and transform our conceptions of work? Welcome. Well, thank you. It's great to be here with, uh, with y'all and thanks all to the, the folks that uh, have come to attend today as well. It's great to be here. So where do you want to get started? Well, I, I like to get started in the beginning, back okay. in the way back machine, because yeah. I think it's important and I think it's interesting for everybody because when researchers get involved in something, there's something, mm -hmm. there's a passion that's driving you. And I think yeah. it's good to hear your origin story because other people can be inspired by that as well because we all have something in us. So share with us how you got involved in this. Well, thanks, Janice. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think there's probably two kind of really simple responses to that, right? Uh, one is at a certain point, I realized that there was a connection between the stuff I was doing as a firefighter. You know, mm -hmm. I started volunteering when I was in high school and just continued, you know, doing that. And taking on different degrees of responsibility within the department. I was, I was in back East and then, um, you know, getting more involved in different, different other organizations where it was like teaching at uh, the Rhode Island fire Academy mm -hmm. or other types of fire academies and passing on the knowledge that I'd learned from other folks. So, you know, at a certain point I started to see the, the relationship and the connection between the work I was doing in the Academy and thinking about literacy and writing and workplace you know, workplace writing, professional and technical communication and, mm -hmm. uh, and the work that folks are doing, you know, out in, out in the world, right. And in particular, in this mm -hmm. context where I was spending a lot of time, you know, outside of my academic world, academic life, thinking about like, how does this correspond to the theories of literacy and rhetorical practice that, that we read, right. And so there was a lot that I, I came to see that wasn't necessarily always talked about, right? And and so it was like, how does this how does this fit into the existing scholarship, right? So it was thinking about, you know, how practices like reading smoke or how how a crew coordinates in zero visibility, how they mm -hmm. coordinate a work activity, right. or you know, how do they interpret risk or how do they make a risk to determination? So there's there's ways where I saw connections to the field, but I also saw you know, gaps or just ways that, um, what the ways that firefighters practice mm -hmm. their craft and yeah. their, you know, their art, um, how that could contribute to our knowledge within TPC of how we, you know, have some conversations that we're interested, in, whether it's risk communication or, you know, multimodality and, and workplace literacy and kind of power differentials per perhaps as well, mm -hmm. you know, as something that plays out in those contexts. So. That was, you know, kind of the more academic route of how I got there. And then the other route is um, my dad did 20 something years in the Navy and then retired and went back to college. My mom, you know, went back to college, too. So there was three of us in college at the same time, which was, you know, pretty, pretty wild yeah. stuff. But uh, he ended up getting a Ph.D. and going in into technical and professional communication as well. He does a lot with um, learning organizations and whatnot. Cool. So, yeah. So you know, he, uh, he jokes that, you know, they became the family business, so to speak. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, so 
I don't know. Like I went to a couple conferences with him and I was like, this is pretty cool. I, I can see why this is pretty fun. So I got pretty into, you know, academia. I thought it was kind of cool. I met some neat people and uh, those relationships really stuck with me. And I, I, I said, I really want to be part of this group of folks that are doing work in this field. So uh, I stuck around and tried to learn as much as I could. Yeah. That's an interesting place to be. There's, I can't, there's not a lot of people who work in that sort of testing and doing research in that high pressure environment. Cause it's not easy to do. Mm. Yeah. That, that research can be pretty tricky. And so that was one of the funner parts of my dissertation and work that I've still continued to do is try to think about how to bring um, or design research methods that allow us to kind of just trace or capture um, examples of the activity the literate, literate yeah. practice and the knowledge work that occurs in, in those kind of situated environments where there is risk. I mean, it's easier at a distance and a lot of the work that, you know, goes into that, you know, the high stakes moment, the fire, the rescue, the, yeah. you know, the accident, the emergency medical call, a lot of that's done at a distance at the station, right. And through practice mm -hmm. and through repetition mm -hmm. and through kind of just cultivating a habitus if, if we were to pull in kind of a Bordeauxian, um, Bordeauxian mm -hmm. theoretical concept, right? And so a lot of the practice is just rooted in that kind of repetition in the culture of different different departments and different organizations and how they, you know, how they operate. And that even flows down to the ways that crews, individual crews can operate, right? And then you have somebody on a flex or a overtime shift filling in so then that changes the dynamic because it's a new new person in that you know ecology right so um you know just kind of zooming out and saying like how do we do this so i looked personally like when i started doing that work i was like hey i want to study this stuff right and i want to look at the ways okay. that firefighters are communicating instructing knowledge and and i knew yeah. kind of where to point the camera to so to speak mm -hmm. but i didn't necessarily know how to point the camera and so i turned to multimodal mm -hmm. And in, in visual ethnography, there's a, n a number of folks, you know, in that in those fields that have developed some digital research methods in order to kind of track and do digital ethnography. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah Pink's work um, has been really influential and influential to me. Um, but you know, there's a number of other folks that have um, that I've cited that I I find really doing are doing really smart. Um, smart and innovative work in terms of laying that groundwork. And so that's where I kind of turned and found a lot of that. And, uh, you know, at, at the time, there wasn't a whole ton of folks doing that necessarily in, in writing studies. Um, I know, you know, there's, there are some folks other aside from me that are doing, I know like Brian McNeely, for instance, at U Kentucky has been doing a lot with digital research methods for a while. And, mm -hmm. and there's other folks as well, but, you know, I think, uh, he's someone that I think I've talked a little bit about some of the stuff with and he's doing some neat work too. So it's exciting. I think he has a book coming out soon too, perhaps on this. It's like methodologies for, for this kind of work. So it's kind of exciting. You have, you're always particularly interesting because you are a connector. You are always, you, you pay attention to what other people are doing Mm -hmm. And you always are like, hey, you asked that question. Well, you should look here, 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 and here. That's not something everybody does. But you're like yeah. exceptionally good at that. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think that's kind of the fun of stuff is just learning what other people are doing and, and staying excited and, and seeing how it can influence or inform, you know, the work that you're, you're taking up. Um, there's so many just neat folks out in, in technical and professional communication that we stand to learn from. You know, I, I really like get a lot um, from my colleague, Donnie Johnson, Siki and, and folks like Jenna, Jennifer Sano Fran, Francini and, uh, you know, just folks that are doing a lot of good work within the cultural rhetoric space and trying to push, you know, how do we build more um, ethical and anti-racist stances towards, towards Techcom, Natasha Jones, Kristen Moore, um, my colleague and collaborator, um, Michelle Simmons, you know, there's just some great folks in, in our field um, doing great work. Angela Haas, Laura Gonzalez, you know, it's, it's, you know, I just look out and I'm like amazed at the people doing, doing the work. Right. And, and so try to read, read what they're putting out as much as possible, because I think they're, they're leading us into how we respond to um, 
just structural problems within how we've kind of come to be as a field, right? And so they're they're providing answers and and pathways for us to think through um, inequity and and injustice within techcom and how technical communicators in particular can work as sites for change, right? And agents for change. Oh yeah. So that's it's exciting to to read that work. So I just I'm thankful to be a member of the field and. Uh, you know, I, I owe a lot to those folks because they helped me think about how to be a better member of the field and, mm-hmm. and how to contribute in, in meaningful ways. Well, and you're digging into this too, right? Because you're looking at uh, technology and how it affects mm-hmm. not not just, you know, your tech worker, but everyone at different levels and different. And you're looking at very specialized places where other people aren't looking. Yeah, I love that you put it that way because... Um, that's something I think a lot about, right? Is that I think some people see my work and they're like, Hey, or I suspect that there's times when people are like, you research something that's super specialized, like firefighters literacies, like, or the technologies that firefighters are using and and how those things are integrating within a set of existing, you know, literacy and ecology of existing literacy practices. Right. And so I'm really interested when we bring this new tool into that ecology of practice what does it do for the existing ecology right so i think Mm -hmm. that's one way to think about it and so you know i think people like you know obviously clay spinuzzi's work has been really influential you know there and um, jenny edbauer rice's work in rhetorical ecologies as well And, and you know i think like also the folks that have done work with with class whether it's like dorothy windsor or um um julie lindquist you know, class and rhetoric, those are things that I think also have a bearing here or that they influence things at, at that kind of macro level. But then getting more specifically into like the fire service and that lens, like, you know, there's practices and existing technologies and there's cultural values that inform them or that kind of carry or are tacitly yeah. attached to those practices. So, you know, sometimes those traditions need to be upended or at least revisited, right? But there's also aspects of practice that can be really valuable. So if we're not, you know, attending to what and how a new technology that's introduced into that setting, what it means for practice, um, I think that could be really problematic because we, we just don't know what the effects are, right? We're not thinking about those in a measured way. And so that can lead to, you know, unintended consequences for practice, right? And so, I, you know, there's yeah. a lot of you know, broader technological narratives about, you know, progress that folks have talked about. Um, you know, Stuart Selbert has talked a little bit about that and Angela Haas as well, you know, and thinking about like how those, you know, technology, technological deterministic or technological determinism and the narrative surrounding technological determinism kind of lead towards this laudatory view of, of technologies that are always going to be better. And, and that just, we all know that isn't the case as, as folks in, within our, our profession, right? We, we design these things. We help bring tools to communities, um, mm-hmm. to practitioners, it, whether it's a workplace or, you know, an end user, you know, in their private life, right? And so I think for me, that's where I like to think about it is that there's broader, broader implications for practice. You know, we can look specifically yeah. at, um, the fire service and say, okay, how does this one ecology, you know, subject to a certain set of forces that we see in other ecologies as well right now. Right. And so we share some, exactly. Yeah. We share some of those same same pressures. Yeah. And so it's, you know, it's teasing those out. And so I think some of that is, you know, in particular, I'm really interested in dispositions towards data and data ownership um, Mm -hmm. in particular. Right. And so, you know, there's been this kind of disposition where I don't think, you know, we all understood what we were getting into. We, I think we understood at a certain level that there's ways in which um, ways in which information is captured about us through our interactions within the web, right? But I don't think everyone is necessarily super aware or assented or granted, you know, consent to the kinds of tracking and surveillance practices that are really built part and parcel into so many of the interfaces that that we've inherited, right? And so I think that's where we have some opportunities right now as technical communicators is to step back and say, how do we use, whether it's like user experience research, 
as a tool to start to re redesign those spaces and, and develop policies and procedures and practices and orientations and, and even just completely new interfaces and policies that, that maybe lead towards a more equitable, equitable exchange of information within those. How do we bring more agency to the, to the end user and to the practitioner? Um, so it's not just the, the designers of the tools capturing the data, you know, that, that have the, the command and control over the data. I see a kitty. Right. I, she's like really, she's, she's in rare form this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I keep blocking her. <laughs> she was tapping me on this shoulder. Now she's moved over to this side. I keep blocking her. <laughs> she has a comment. Yeah, it's interesting because we were talking about uh, wearables, like for medical devices. And the yeah. Function. Um, yeah. Just, uh, in past ago? room 42 session two episodes ago yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um yeah so go on yeah i think the, the i think you're right that the technical communicators can really help shed some light on that because you're gathering all this data and what's being done to the data and are the the people who are wearing the mm -hmm. devices like because these are some of these are firefighters that are wearing medical devices that are tracking their information while they're in the middle of fighting fires and rescuing lives, right? Well, yeah, kind of. I don't know that it's really, we're there yet, right? So um, this is a really a great example, I think, of, of how emerging technologies are changing work right now, right? And so this is the kind of question that I'm really, really deeply interested in. I think some of those technologies exist, right? Mm -hmm. And I think just to be really careful about it, I think there's a differentiation that we have to draw between uh, performance or physiological data and medical data, right? And so legally mm -hmm. speaking and technically speaking, there, there's some differences in terms of how those data come to mean in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. medical data has a kind of uh, standing that differs from the kind of data that a Garmin would, would capture, for instance, right? So, right. you know, a lot of the folks that I work with, you know, um, you know, there's, you know, some folks locally within Fort Collins, um, Captain Housley and Captain McKeon, for instance, um, they're doing a lot. They have this um, kind of um, this project that they've started up called Firefighter Craftsmanship. And um, they, they're doing a lot with thinking about what is the relationship about performance and, and physical performance and how it shapes decision making. And that those are the kind of questions I'm really interested in is, mm -hmm. you know, when we get to that point where we're redlined, how does that start to impact um, our, our ability to perceive and interpret risk, you know, because that's where we yeah. start to see within some of the, um, you know, the um, fatality research, you know, there's, there's information and literacy um, and communication breakdowns, mm. or those literacy and communication are, are central to, uh, to, to uh, events going in a direction that leads to folks getting injured or, or, or killed, right? And so I think that's where we have some opportunities to intercede. You know, those events are actually relatively yeah. minor in comparison to the more mundane things like cancer and, you know, behavioral health emergencies, you know, that aren't often yeah. talked about, right? So there's, that's, that's something worth kind of noting within this particular context, you know, that I want to be careful about that it isn't, you know, that those are relatively, actually, we've done a pretty good job through training and education, I think of of moving the ball on firefighter fatality and injury, right? Mm -hmm. uh, within the line, uh, within the field. Um, but there are some other things where we have, have work to do um, that are more mundane, you know, and, and some of that is just like, you know, heart, heart disease and heart risk and, and, you know, cardiologic strain, you know, um, and thinking about that, you know, so when we, we mm -hmm. think about the work that the McKeon folks are doing and McKeon and, and, and Housley, the, the folks locally and, within the community. And, and then there's some other folks, um, Denise Smith at Skidmore is a physiological researcher, Dr. Denise Smith and, and her team over at Skidmore College have done a lot to lead, you know, how do we bring physiological monitoring into the fire service at a national level? Mm -hmm. um, you know, she, her and her collaborators have really, they started the kind of move in this direction in a lot of ways. And so the team that I work with here, we've been fortunate, you know, to be able to participate in some conversations with, 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 with um, Dr. Smith's group 
and uh, other, you know, folks at a national level. You know, we went to the um, National Fallen Firefighters Physiological Summit. And one of the things we talked about was, was kind of this d- differentiation in data, right? The difference between medical and physiological data. So the kind of, to return back to that original thing, there's a lot mm-hmm. of folks that are using off the, off the, st- off the shelf tools and saying, how can we get some data? you know, and what does it mean? You know, so I have friends that were, you know, they do a training and they're, they're looking at their, their heart rate and they're saying, okay, we're, you know, I was at 98% of my maximal heart rate, or I was above my maximal heart rate for, you know, this much period of, of time in this, in this evolution of, of practice that we're going through. Mm-hmm. And so they're trying to train, how long can they be at different percentages of, of physiological peak performance Mm -hmm. and still perform well like they're doing math equations they're stopping and doing like word problems or you know um you know long Mm -hmm. form division with multiple steps you know to to see how well that their cognitive Cognitive uh, performance yeah Yeah. Yeah. so they're trying to train that body mind relationship with Mm -hmm. these these off the off the shelf tools right and so it's really cool to see that but i think that's where we start to get into the slippery slope of of what does it mean to bring these tools into practice now? Because when we start to think about them in that they do, even the physiologic tool, physiological tools that are available, uh, the physiological monitoring tools allow us to make inferences. Mm-hmm. But, you know, only a medical practitioner can actually render those. But we know that when people see things, they, you know, when they have access to that data, they make their own decisions, right? And so it's well, how do we- some conclusions, some inferences. Yes. Yeah. And they might not be trained or have the expertise to initially interpret that in a meaningful way. Right. And so that's they might consult Dr. G. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, that's where I think we have to be really careful with this because we don't want a peer looking at someone else's data or looking over the shoulder and being like, oh, you know, so-and-so isn't ready to go do the work, you know? And, and so how do we negotiate that the fact mm. that there's difference within workplace Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what, what, you know, and how people are going to perform and still, you know, it's certainly that we, we need to have certain kinds of baselines of what's, what's, um, what's going to be, I guess, um, appropriate for practice, um, within different organizations. Right. And I think that that can't necessarily be, um, a one standard for, for all departments, You know, it can't be one size fits all because organizations and communities have different needs. And so we have to understand what those needs and expectations are, you know, and work within those. And so more of a contextual approach. And I think that's where like tech con folks can really help to start to understand what is the the expectation here within the organization, you know, and how do we set up some some parameters around this that could lead towards more agency and autonomy from the end users. Well, because I think with uh, people who are technical writers, I mean, they're trained, they're very critical, not in a bad way. They, mm-hmm. they'll, they'll think like, you know, I might go happily lumping down. Oh, I'll just wear my Garmin and test all this stuff and make these, you know, Dr. G conclusions. But they're like, wait, what is the ethical ramifications and all mm-hmm. of these other connecting factors? And, and I think they're more apt to look at things from a very ethical perspective. And I think building that in, in the beginning, before you go rumbling down some path, Mm -hmm. I think, I think more people need to be talking about the ethics and the ethics are, they're applied a little different in different places. You have to have cultural considerations, but I think you bring up a really good point that there needs to be that ethical conversation should be first instead of last. Yeah. Um, Ethic, ethics and equity and justice, mm-hmm. like all of those things need to be centered Up more right. in terms, yeah, in, in terms of the, the design design yeah. paradigm, right? And yeah. the design yeah. processes. And, and that's where it's like, you know, Kristen and Natasha's work and Donnie's work, you know, has been really influential. And Laura Gonzalez's yeah. work as well. You yeah. know, those folks have really, I think, called on us in a certain way to, to attend to these things in, in really more careful, careful ways. Um, you know, I think in terms of data as well, you know, like the work that Estee Beck and, and Les Hutchinson Campos has done, you know, those folks are doing some really interesting work on, uh, on data and also Krista, Ken- Krista Kennedy as well. 
And, mm-hmm. and Chris has done some really neat work on wearables as well. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think like there's so many folks keen into different parts of it. And so it's how do we pull those different parts of the, you know, the concept together to build a really, um, a really smart and agile, you know, justice informed design paradigm. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I, I don't know that any of this is really all that new, right? Like participatory action research has been a thing for a long time. Right. And user mm-hmm. experience has been a thing, but it's like, how does that necessarily fit into a, a technical writing or a design paradigm? Right. And so mm-hmm. organizations have to be willing to say, you know, we're going to invest in, in bringing people in that help us think about these questions and really center that in the design approach rather than thinking about this is something we solve after the fact. Right. Right. And so with, with the folks that, you know, I see doing this right now, there isn't necessarily a commercial, a viable commercial, you know, platform right now that exists, right. Um, for folks in the fire service to just grab, grab something and get all the data and, and really make super meaningful decisions about all the data points. Right. Um, you know, there's folks that have done the research or that have used, um, that have used like in, ingestible physiological monitors to track mm-hmm. like body, you know, or implantables. Yeah. So there's researchers doing this stuff in different contexts, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and there's and my colleague at, at the Human Performance Clinical Research Laboratory here at, at Colorado State, Tiffany Lipsy, over in that lab, they do all sorts of kind of really neat stuff you know, and they work a, a lot with firefighters in particular, but there's some other communities that, that they do work with as well with this, um, you know, from elite athletes to, you know, to military folks as well. And mm-hmm. so, you know, there's yeah. a lot of stuff going on in this area, but um, the fact of the matter is we just don't have good tools necessarily for, for doing it at, at the kind of organizational level. We haven't thought about it. And I think that's actually a good thing right now, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Because I think that gives us time to try to think about how to bring these kind of tools in that do provide access to these new kinds of data and information and start to build some paradigms that say, what are the ethical implications? What are, you know, how do we do this and ensure for equity? How do we think about justice? Like, I think part of it, this is like a, a, a so what way of thinking about it in a certain sense. But, you know, a lot of times the ways careers have been defined within that industry in particular is, you know, 25 years and out or something in a lot of organizations, you know, after 25 years, you know, you, you qualify for a pension, which in a certain way makes sense, but it's also kind of arbitrary, right? How does that, how does that lead towards a differential exposure to stress and the implications that has on a body, physical, psychological, emotional, um, cardiological, you know, all the different kinds of stress that these folks are going to, you know, experience in their career. The 25 you know, years. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. it mm-hmm. is bringing these tools in. Does it allow us to capture exposure to stress in a different way and start to think about, think about exposure in, in different ways and to think about a career longevity or career point in a different way. Right. And so, I think if we're just using these as surveillance tools to be like, you know, we got to get Joe on a, on a plan to get, get them back to, you know, what, what our performance standard within this organization is that that's somewhat problematic. Right. Um, I mean, and that's an understatement, but I think that's where, you know, the, the initial view of how the internet of things can be used for, for most folks is, Hey, we can get new information and now we can, plug it into this command and control top, top site paradigm where, you know, understanding is reserved for, for management, you know, and, and we just scoop that up. And so Zuboff's like, you know, back in, in her earlier work was like, Hey, we have an opportunity with these new information communication technologies to change this paradigm. We can continue to recycle that kind of monopolistic c- command managerial tailorist frame. Or we can start to say, how do we return that information to, to the end users, to the workers on the front line, so to speak, doing the work, you know, and, and, and start to say, how do they, how can they um, engage in intellectualization and, and, and form new practices from that, the new information and data that they have access to, right? How can they use their, 
their creativity and their knowledge as workers and their expertise as, as practitioners to start to think about how that data informs what they're doing. And so that's why I get really excited about the folks like at Pooter Fire that are doing this or the folks, you know, in some organizations that I'm working with that, you know, are tracking their workouts and starting to see like, how does that data influence practice? Right. And, you know, Hey, I know I didn't sleep good or I haven't right. been, eating, I didn't have the best set of meals over the past you know week. So I right. want to get back on my, my nutrition plan. Right. So, right. you know, it's right. like, it's not to say that everyone needs yeah. to like live that life, but giving people some more tools and more, more, more information so they can make decisions and see how it's tracking with their individual bodies. Right. It, I mean, it affects their choice. I, I, I have a Fitbit and I live by it. <laughs> yeah. I can track, it tracks how, how do I sleep? How many times am I waking up? Like all of these different things. Well, what can I do different? Maybe I don't drink so much water just before I go to bed. So I don't have to get up in the middle of the night so I can get a better REM sleep. Like, so for me, it, it does, because I have a tendency not to get enough sleep. So I want to watch that and I can track that as an individual. But then if somebody else were tracking this as a company for a different reason, a manage a management team. Yeah. Be a different, right. That'd be a different, like this is, I have control of it. Right. Yeah. And I think like, you know, more globally, if we zoom out, right, you know, mm -hmm. when we look at this, you know, I think surveillance and privacy is, is something I think a lot about. Right. But, mm -hmm. you know, that also assumes that we're looking at this organization as it is already. Right. And I think there's broader implications where we start to look at this and start to see how could these tools. And, and this is where I look at like folks like uh, Sophia Umja. Noble's work with algorithms of oppression or Chris Gilliard's work on digital redlining, you know, mm -hmm. those kind of folks that are thinking about this stuff, like how are these kind of tools particularly um, leveraged in, in, in purposeful ways to kind of, you know, re-instantiate structures of oppression and, and injustice and exclusion, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so yes. that's where I think there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, you know, at the more institutional and, and social level to rethink, you know, what are our practices and how do they lead to, uh, you know, homogenous cultures of, of work in, in individuals within certain settings. And so I think that's where the fire service in, in a particular way, you know, um, has a lot of work to do, like so many organizations and institutions among us right now, right, um, to rethink, you know, how do we how do we move towards a more representative fire service that, you know, looks like the people in the communities that it serves. Um, I think that doesn't lead to the best outcomes. Um, you know, and we've seen that in, in certainly within policing, but um, there's other contexts as well. So um, yeah, I think uh, you know, there's so much work to be done there, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so that's where these tools have, have something that we need to be very careful about. Right. Um, you know, and so, I think that gets back to like, you know, where Zuboff's like, hey, we can use use these tools in, in ways that could be good and could lead towards worker emancipation and empowerment, mm -hmm. or we can use these tools in ways that ultimately um, adversely impacts the agency that, that workers and end users have, right, within within a si system. So it's that I think that's, sword. yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's where there's just so much work for us to be doing right now, whether it means like revisiting terms of service or thinking about terms of service, or even just saying like, you know, working with data scientists and engineers on tools to say, does this app, does this wearable, does this platform, why do we need this data row, right? Mm -hmm. What are we going to be doing with this? And, and is that use of, of that circulatory use of that information and that data you know, the recomposition to borrow from, you know, the work mm -hmm. of Jim Rodolfo and, and Danielle DeVos, you know, what is the rhetorical velocity of this data and, and what are the ethics of, of creating data and allowing for different kinds of, of rhetorical velocity and recomposition in the future? So I think that's where, you know, there's just so much potential within that concept in particular for mm -hmm. thinking about design, you know, and I, I know that Bill and Jim are thinking a lot about that vis-a-vis you know, information warfare and rhetorical ops and in and, and the work that they've recently done. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think that's where I start to think about it and, you know, framing it through that, you know, the, the equity and inclusion and justice lens 
you know, where we see how could this tool be used to, for instance, to screen applicants and just exclude applicants that could be great firefighters, but don't necessarily meet the standards on day one, right? Mm -hmm. You know, because of whether it's access to, mm-hmm. you know, nutrition or access to uh, open spaces where we, we know from a public health perspective that, that you know, the, the access to natural spaces and, and, and places to exercise is inequitably distributed within right. within our, our states and our countries, right? All right. So, well, in that, I mean, I think, you know, just from the staffing perspective and the HR perspective, it's, it's a different slant when you're looking from, am I looking to staff from a perspective of inclusion or exclusion? And I think a lot of times, most of the time, people are exclusive and not inclusive, right? Mm-hmm. Because in, in inclusive, you're going to you're going to factor in all of these other things and think, well, okay, a little bit to overcome, but not impossible, right? They could be a really good firefighter. They don't hit on this level, but I want to include them rather than exclude. Just use everything to cut everybody out. It's mm-hmm. a different perspective. Yeah, yeah, and I think we've seen a lot of that, to be honest. You know, within mm-hmm. within the fire service, so. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of work to do on that front. And so that's where I mean, I on the exclusive, exclusive perspective, that's in all industries. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. not always, I think there's a, a number of places where we start to see, you know, organizations saying, what does it mean to build, you know, a really truly, you know, inclusive environment and a, a truly I, yeah. just organization, right? I think, I think there are, but I think that there's a lot of work because it really does come down to, I mean, mm-hmm. and that's, that's just the social structure. That's a social uh, construct is because, you know, a lot of times, even just in volunteer organizations or mm-hmm. people like me, like, who can I get to do this? And they're not intentionally pushing themselves outside to include people. They're just trying to pull in people they know. Right. So I think yeah. that's one of those psychological things we all need to kind of break. In our yeah. Society. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, too, because that gets at, you know, I think this this difference between the volunteer fire service, which comprises 70 percent of the United States fire service. Right. Which is, Mm -hmm. you know, when we think about firefighters, like it's that's a big part of of what makes up this this institution within America. Right. And Mm so um, a lot of the standards are built, you know, at the national level. The, the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Agency, are built in ways that um, I think work more easily for departments that are career, that are well-funded. I think even career departments mm-hmm. with, with budgetary limitations find themselves in, in certain um, situations where they, they uh, I would suspect, um, kind of encounter the same challenges that volunteer organizations often are working through as well, right? And so um, I think those standards can be exclusionary in a certain sense in that way too, where it's like, okay, if we're excluding 70% of the fire service from practice, mm-hmm. you know, do these standards, what, what's the value of these standards, right? Mm-hmm. And so is there a standard for the, the, career, the career folks? Is there a standard for the volunteer folks? What does it mean to have a tension between two differentials within those standards? You know, and so I think that's where we start to see those kind of things where, you know, best practice can be this, but there's material constraints that impact our ability to necessarily get there. Right. And so, um, you know, it's, there's a pursuit of excellence in a lot of organizations or a desire to pursue greatness in a lot of organizations within the fire service that I think is, is, you know, they want to be exceptional organizations. They don't want to just be good because right. of what's at stake and, the, and they take the mission seriously. And I really, exactly. I respect that and I get where that comes from, mm-hmm. but it's, how do you kind of do that? How do you maintain greatness um, without being exclusionary and also building pathways that could, could lead towards greater, greater inclusion and greater justice mm-hmm. within, within hiring practices and retention practices. And, and just that could allow for new um, knowledge places Mm-hmm. And cultural commonplaces to maybe enter that 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 organizational 
in that industry. You know, mm-hmm. so I think there's, um, there's work to be done there, um, I think. Yeah. So it, it's an interesting, oh, geez, we've only got two minutes left. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's really interesting because, see, you, you know, in the beginning you said, oh, it's just the fire department. But look at how impactful just that little microcosm is on a global yeah. scale. Like what you're, what you're talking about is applicable to every industry out there, not just firefighting. Is mm-hmm. every industry the difference in firefighting is a, in any emergency situation this is the difference between life and death so there's a mm-hmm. sensitivity that comes to it but a lot of the things that you're talking about are so applicable to so many yeah. so many people and so many industries um it has been such a delight i, I wanted yeah. to get into talking to you about so what's up, what's up for the next year for you um yeah but uh, I know, we'll and I had a question I've been sitting time. on. We'll have that for the next time we have okay. you back because we've got you earmarked to come back again because we know what you're working on for the next year. Well, that's great. Yeah, it has been such a delight. I don't think I got through all of the questions that people provided, but that's okay because they can reach out to you directly as well. Yeah, yeah, right? reach out. Absolutely. It's great. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. It was uh, it was excellent. You know, to to. It was really fun have this dialogue and to talk a little bit about the, the things I'm thinking a lot about and the folks that are influencing my thinking right now. It's very inspiring. It's very thought provoking. Yes. And, and I love these conversations because you dig in deep, but it's, it sparks something. It does in me every time. So, yeah. well, that's, you know, thank you. That's kind. I think that's the whole point, right? To get that, get that fire started and everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Get that fire started. Catch a fire. Yeah, catch that flame and run with it. Yeah. Well, thank you.